Coming up today, in an unprecedented move, the U.S. government announces sanctions against North Korean leader Kim Jong-un for human rights abuses. It freezes any assets he might have in the United States. Officials from the government, presidential office and parliament are set to meet for talks on economic revitalization and the restructuring of South Korea's ailing industries. First, with exactly a month to go before the game start, President Park and Hay visits South Korean athletes preparing for the 2016 Olympics in Rio. Stay tuned for these stories and more. Hello to our viewers around the world. It's 6am on Thursday, July 7th here in Seoul. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Broom. Our top story this morning, the United States has, for the first time, put North Korean leader Kim Jong-un on its sanctions list for human rights abuses. The U.S. Treasury Department says the sanctions, the first to target any North Koreans for rights abuses, affect property and other assets within U.S. jurisdiction and extend to 10 other individuals and five government ministries and departments. In a statement, Washington's acting Under Secretary for Terrorism and Financial Intelligence, Adam Schu, Shubin said that, quote, under Kim Jong-un, North Korea continues to inflict intolerable cruelty and hardship on millions of its own people, including extrajudicial killings, forced labor and torture, end quote. He added that, while largely symbolic, the action highlights the U.S. government's condemnation of the regime's abuses and the determination to see them stopped. Experts say North Korea may lash out and respond with provocations further escalating tension on the Korean peninsula. The designation was made in line with the State Department report on the North's human rights. In that report, the State Department recommended sanctions against a total of 15 officials and eight entities of which the Treasury Department has followed through with those sanctions. Now, it has been confirmed that North Korea as a sudden discharge of water from one of its dams this week did not cause any damage in South Korea. Officials in the South say that water levels on the Imjingang River started gradually receding from late Wednesday night. News that will bring some comfort to residents near the border who had to be evacuated. Authorities estimate that 500 tonnes of water a second would take about nine hours to reach uh, Gunnam Dam in the south. Military authorities say North Korea discharged water from its Hwangang Dam at around 6 a.m. on Wednesday, around 24 hours ago, prompting South Korean authorities to evacuate border area residents for fear of flooding. North Korea had not given South Korea prior notification of the water discharge, despite an agreement to do so signed back in 2009. South Korea's rival political parties have agreed to launch a parliamentary probe into the toxic humidifier sterilizer case. The ruling and minor opposition parties were also busy on Wednesday getting their houses in order with a shake-up of their respective leaderships. Park ji reports. During Wednesday's assembly plenary session, 250 lawmakers attending the session unanimously adopted a motion to launch an official parliamentary proof into the toxic humidifier sterilizer case that caused over a hundred deaths over recent years in one of the country's worst consumer product scandals. Korea's political parties had agreed at the end of last month to start a parliamentary investigation. The probe will kick off on Thursday and will continue for 90 days until early October, aiming to get to the bottom of the incident. The investigation will focus on finding out exact causes and liabilities of sterilizer producing companies, chemical material suppliers and the government, which failed at safely managing the wrongful distribution of toxic chemical products. The special committee will be chaired by Wu won from the main opposition Minju Party of Korea. We urge lawmakers to conduct this probe from the perspective of the public and the victims. The special committee will lead the investigation of the toxic humidifier disinfectant case. 
Lawmakers have also finalized setting up seven new special parliamentary committees during Wednesday's plenary session. They include committees on tackling Korea's low birth rate, improving inter-Korean relations and handling preparations for the 2018 Winter Olympics to be held in Pyeongchang, Gangwon-do province. The committees will consist of 18 members each, and they will be active until the end of this year. Meanwhile, two of the country's three main political parties are gearing up to reshape their party leadership structures. Lawmakers from the ruling Senori party held a general members meeting Wednesday afternoon for the first time since the conservative party welcomed back seven of its lawmakers who left the party prior to the April general election. They discussed ways to revamp their leadership and vowed to avoid factional views to improve the party's structure. The minor opposition People's Party, whose co-leaders recently resigned, also unveiled the 11 members of its new emergency council. We, the Supreme Council members, completed our respective roles for the party, and from now on, the new emergency council members will lead the party. The 11-member emergency council will lead the centrist party until the party's convention currently is scheduled to take place early next year. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. Now staying with domestic politics and officials from the government, presidential office and parliament will meet today for the first time since the 20th National Assembly opened in May. They'll discuss pending bills on economic revitalization as well as the government's fiscal stimulus plan announced last week that includes a supplementary budget of eight and a half billion US dollars, the government's corporate restructuring and countermeasures to the financial impact of Brexit will also be on the agenda. It's exciting because the 2016 Summer Olympics in Rio is now just one month away and uh, the anticipation is building by the day now. To provide the athletes with some moral support, President Park and Hay on Wednesday dropped by their main training centre in Seoul. Song ji with the details. Team Korea's goal for Rio. A 10-10 scenario with 10 gold medals and finishing among the top 10 for the fourth consecutive summer games. And the optimism is high at this training facility, filled with hope and dedication poured out by Korean Olympic athletes. I cannot say who is the favorite for the Rio Games, because everyone in our squad has the potential to win a medal at the Olympics. Marking the one-month countdown to the 2016 Olympic Games in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, President Park geun visited the National Training Center to encourage athletes to reach their goals. Park also ordered officials to assist and ensure the safety of the athletes from health concerns like the Zika virus as well as possible terror attacks. Seoul will also set up a base camp in Rio to help them adapt to the environment, which includes offering the athletes Korean food. Praising the national athletes for their efforts, President Park asked them to give hope and dreams to the Korean people and inspire young athletes. Song Ji-seon, Arirang News. Staying with the build-up to the Rio Olympics, there's one particular discipline in which Korea excels. Archery. No country has come close to challenging Korea's reign since the nation's medal-winning streak began at the 1984 Olympics in Los Angeles. Our Kwon jang -ho, went to meet the squad as they enter the final stages of their preparation. Let's take a look. Rio is now in sight and Korea's Olympic teams are making their final preparations. The Korean Olympic Committee has set its sights on another top 10 finish with a target of 10 gold medals. And the sport carrying the weight of the highest expectations is archery. Since South Korea first competed in Olympic archery in 1984, they have won 19 golds out of a possible 30. That's a 63% win rate. 
Korea's women archers have been especially successful. They have won every gold medal bar one in the individual and team events. The question everyone always asks is how do they get so good? I'm here at the Bochuk Sky Dome in Seoul. You may be asking why I'm at a baseball stadium and what's this got to do with archery? Well, it's because the Korean national archery team are here for some special psychological training, practicing to perform under distracted conditions and learning to focus. The loud MCs, blaring music and cheering crowds are all designed to give the athletes a taste of what it's like to perform in front of an Olympic audience. Compared to practicing at the athlete's village, performing in front of this huge crowd definitely makes me more nervous. When our archers make mistakes in big tournaments, it's not because they lack skills, but they get affected by the atmosphere and it makes them not perform to their full potential. This is part of an extensive mental training regime the athletes go through. The psychological aspect is said to be the most important factor in competitive archery, more than skill or fitness. Hard work and skill count for 95 to 98 percent. At big events like the Olympics, the competitors' fitness and skill level are similar, but the order of the medals is determined by how strong you are mentally. Even though Korea's record in archery has been exceptional, by paying attention to the smallest of details in their training and preparation, they're looking to leave nothing to chance. Kwon Jang Woo, Arirang News. Now, in other news, South Korean and U.S. Marines are conducting a joint drill near Korea's southeastern city of Pohang. The two allies have deployed some high-tech weaponry and around 1,500 military personnel. Our Defence Ministry correspondent Kim Hyun Bin with the details. Allied forces have detected enemy movements. Soon enough. A U.S. Marine Super Cobra helicopter launches rockets and Balkans at the target. On the ground, South Korea's K-55 and U.S. M-777 self-propelled artillery fires off covering airborne units. With enough damage done, South Korea U.S. amphibious landing crafts fire off smoke bombs leading to Marine platoons, get into enemy facilities, securing the premises. This military scenario is part of the South Korea U.S. joint drill dubbed the final exercise with more than 800 South Korean Marines and 500 U.S. Marines taking part. Besides the military staff, the exercise also mobilized some 150 tactical weaponry, including Super Cobra helicopters and K-55 tanks. The Korean Marine Corps says the joint training focuses on destroying key enemy facilities. South Korea and U.S. Marines are at the forefront of their inter-Korean border and are the most powerful unit in line. If the enemy threatens national security, we are fully ready to counter strongly. The joint Marine drills first began in 2012, but unlike previous years, this year's exercise has integrated all branches of the military for the first time. In case there were ever a need for us to, to work together in a real time of combat, uh, we already have that mutual relationship and understanding uh, how to communicate with each other and how to coordinate our fires together uh, for the safety and security of the Korean Peninsula. These exercises enhance interoperability and crisis management between the two allies. Essential training considering Seoul's unpredictable neighbor to the north. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News, Huang. The European Union will be sending business delegations to Korea over the next five years to establish new business deals and boost networks. Under the initiative, companies from both sides will be able to expand their cooperation in promising growth sectors. Kim Min-ji with the details. Local manufacturer KMTC has been in charge of the sales and management of wind turbines produced by UK-based Kingspan Wind for the last three years. They established their partnership through the EU Gateway to Korea, a business program initiated by the European Union. Since then, it's been beneficial for both sides, with KMTC able to access new technology, while Kingspan has used Korea to expand into other Asian markets. Through the program, we can overcome any unexpected problems that arise when expanding overseas by establishing deals with experienced and competitive companies. We've been learning a lot of from a local company. So local company, they understand Korean market, um, you know, rather than Kingspan. So they have a local base, they have a local customers, so they understand local culture. 
The EU Gateway program was launched as a channel for cooperation between European companies and their strategic counterparts in Asia. It began in Japan in 1990 and has since expanded to many countries, including Singapore and Vietnam. The second round is currently underway in Seoul. Over the next five years, the European Union will dispatch business delegations from five promising sectors, from green energy to healthcare and the environment, with the aim of fostering business deals and partnerships with Korean companies. The EU business delegation can meet with local companies and expand their business networks. It's part of a larger effort to foster new growth engines for Korea. We want to bring a thousand companies to Korea the next five years, and we know that uh, Korea is also a European gateway to Asia. So we will soon see how we can bring uh, companies from the green economy uh, to Korea first, also to boost the greening of the Korean economy. The program is expected to help support Korea's policies in combating climate change and environmental protection, on top of providing access to advanced European products and technologies. Kim min Arirang News. Well, that's all we have for now. I'm Mark Bream. Thank you, as always, for watching. We'll be back throughout the day with more newscasts. So until then, goodbye.